Uh, welcome to Orlando. We're at the 2015 ASH meeting. I'm joined here by my colleagues. I'm John Gribben from London, Alessandro Tedeschi from Italy, Patrick Thornton from uh, Ireland, and uh, Professor Stefan Stilgenbauer, who's uh, omnipresent at this meeting from Ulm. We're here to talk about lots of the exciting things, again, which we're seeing in CLL. And uh, yet again, we've seen lots of new data, particularly on the novel agents, which is what I'd like to focus on today. So, Alessandra, you had the uh, opportunity to present the, one of the big breaking news at the meeting um, was the, uh, the Resonate 2 study. So, this, of course, is the study which is uh, the uh, upfront uh, study of abrutinib. So, do you want to tell us about uh, what the uh, findings are of the study and what you think that means for our CLL patients? Well, the importance of the study was that it's the first randomized study um, evaluating ibrutinib in first-line treatment uh, in uh, treatment-naive patients in, and was addressed specifically to elderly patients. And um, was a comparison between uh, ibrutinib and the, the standard uh, treatment that was considered at the time the study was uh, uh, designed, uh, the standard treatment chloramucil. You th a lot of these studies have come in for criticism um, that the comparative arm is never really the standard of care that we have right now. What do you think about chlorambucil nowadays as a comparative arm for a study? In this moment, chlorambucil is not the uh, standard of care for mm. uh, elderly patients, but at uh, the, the moment the study was designed, sure. uh, was uh, considered the, the, the standard of care. So, uh, of course, now the comparator would be chlorambucil plus uh, uh, but uh, uh, those days was uh, uh, just uh, chloramucil. But uh, apart from the control arm, uh, I would say that uh, I would show sure to be highly effective. Spectacular uh, is the spectacular, word I would use yes, to describe the results. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great progression for survival, a significantly longer over survival, even though there was uh, the possibility to cross over for the patients uh, when they had a progressive disease. So um, the, the overall survival curves are uh, um, dividing and uh, this is uh, an important issue. Now this has been a recurrent theme of all of these studies of the novel agents, that even with a crossover design, we still see uh, overall survival differences at the end of the studies, suggesting that it's not the right approach to start gently and keep these drugs till later. Is that how you interpret that data I, too? Yes, of course. And this is, I think that this is a bigger problem with elderly patients because if you don't give immediately um, a, a treatment that may control the disease, uh, what happens in the elderly with comorbidity, they worsen their condition and uh, at the end they are not clinically fit to receive a second line treatment. Sure. I think that this is important most with the elderly um, because of their comorbidity, so the outcome is worse in these patients. Sure. So think, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you yet, John, but I think this is indeed a, a point worth noting that we've start see, started seeing this with the introduction of biological agents mm. actually now dating back, you could almost say, to CLL8 with yes. FCR versus FC, where, th where for the first time we saw this overall survival difference, and not stipulated in the trial, but I mean, available was a crossover because the patients could have been treated with frituximab containing regimens in relapse. Still, we saw that, and it is really like with biological agents that we started to begin to see this difference. I think one of the features, of course, is how the IWCLL criteria define progression. I think to progress above baseline is not how we would retreat a patient at relapse. So I do think the barrier is set sometimes too high. We would not wait until a patient had progressed the way an independent review panel does before perhaps we might do treatment. But that notwithstanding, the results are absolutely clear cut. They could not be more clear. Do you think? Um, now that we're sitting all here from Europe, do you really believe that uh, ibrutinib will become the established frontline therapy for elderly patients in CLL? I think that there will be some patients that can benefit from ibrutinib for sure. Uh, maybe the more frail patients, um, still in the fit patients, immunochemotherapy mm. 
has a role in this moment. Uh, of course, not the very frail patients, uh, but there is a, a part of the patients that can benefit from I would Sure. Uh, in fact, the randomised trial suggests that over 65 patients should have a, a survival advantage for having this therapy. So, Patrick, do you think that in Ireland it will become a, a, a regular therapy for well, frontline patients well on I, the basis of this study? Well, I think for P53 deletion there shouldn't be no there should be no question about it. It should be first line treatment. I think when you look at overall ASH this year for CLL, there's an overwhelming amount of information on new studies, new antibodies, novel agents. And it's hard to see any, any report which doesn't say overall response rate greater than 80%. We have a new antibody with a benetuzumab and it's improved the efficacy of clarambucil. Um, I think the question always is, um, you always have to have your drug reimbursed outside a clinical trial. And uh, so sometimes it can be an uphill struggle, even though you've got extremely effective drugs to convince your, your authorities that, uh, that these drugs are worth paying for. By every standard that the authorities would ask for, a randomised trial against an appropriate comparator showing an overall survival, that should be enough to, this should be paradigm shifting. This, should that, be. That's always been the standard in which we've changed therapy before. Is that not the case now here too? It should be. Yeah. Do you think in Germany that frontline therapy will move? No, I think so. I think it's just great to see that we have all these options available. Now we shouldn't, you know, uh, argue that now we don't know what to do. I mean, it's great that we have these options for our patients. And uh, even as we stated that there was this overall survival benefit, we should say, well, for some patients, maybe obinutuzumab plus carambosil would be an option. It's a finite treatment duration. You can uh, probably uh, get into a remission in the majority of patients with this regimen and then you still have ibrutinib also to salvage them because this was actually not analyzed in the trial if this strategy in the longer run could not uh, at least for some patients also result into very very beneficial survival times. Sure. Well of course we've already completed accrual of the Illuminate trial which will mm. give us the answer yeah. maybe even as early as next ASH we may be seeing a late breaking abstract uh, from from Illuminate. So Patrick, what's been the, the other than Resonate 2, what's been the highlights of this meeting from your perspective? Well, I think um, it's, it, it's, it's hard to pick out. There's so much information. Um, I mean, we have, for a while now, we've had our, our novel B cell receptor antagonist with our idlalaseb and our Ibrutinib. Um, and we're getting more and more data coming through and we're having presentations on combinations of these drugs, which is very interesting. Um, we have the new uh, benetuzumab and Stefan presented uh, the subset from the CLL with the bendamustin and a benetuzumab, which maybe we'd have time to chat about after that. Another thing which is certainly worth mentioning and uh, unescapable is the BH3 mimetic, the mm. uh, venatoclax, the uh, BCL2 inhibitor. Um, it, it was very striking, the presentations, the very deep remissions, the complete remissions, and even people who remained in remission when the drug was stopped. Um, I just think it's, it's a very exciting drug. Um, looking forward to participating in clinical trials with that. Mm. Sure. So Stefan, I almost don't know where to start with you. You've presented so much at this meeting. There's lots of things we could pick up on and particularly you've been presenting a lot of new data. So of course, on the theme of phenetoclax, you're, you're pre presenting the data for of the, uh, the pivotal, the, you know, the, the phase two 17P trials. So what's the highlights of, uh, of, of that? I think venetoclax is uh, really uh, a new treatment paradigm in the sense that now we have first, first of ever actually an agent available that is really efficiently targeting BCL2 and BCL2 is kind of a uh, almost a unifying feature of all cancers. It is very highly expressed in many cancers, in particular in CLL and therefore it's a biologically very valid target and, and this trial together with other data shows that this can really be tackled in a clinically meaningful way. Nevertheless, it needs to be handled with care mm -hmm. because the efficacy mm -hmm. is so um, uh, so great and so rapid in onset that you have to uh, use a careful ramp up dosing scheme and have to monitor the patients not to have too much of a good thing. Sure. Now, lots of preclinical data we saw at this meeting also uh, looking at the potential mechanisms of synergy of, of these types of agents and of course we can look at ways in which we can put together all of the agents we've been 
talking about here. But an obvious combination, of course, would be a Butin and Venetoclax uh, combinations. And I think uh, lots of those sorts of trials going to start. So if we think that a Butin is an expensive agent and can only presume that Venetoclax is going to be an expensive agent, what do you think it's going to take for us to be able to offer you know, do, uh, doublets or triplets of these agents together to uh, to our patients. We are going to have the same scenario for multiple myeloma in <laughs> in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, what I think is that uh, there must be well addressed stu studies to understand in which categories uh, and which categories of patients may benefit from. Uh, certain type of uh, combinations. Sure. So a good analogy to use to be thinking about CLL compared to multiple myeloma. Do you think, Patrick, our goal should be that we just prolong survival by sequencing the drugs or do you think we're on the cusp of potentially going all the way for very deep remissions and day one you start to use the cure word in CLL with the powerful agents that we now have available that we've heard about at this meeting? Well, theoretically, if you can get a deep enough MRD negativity, um, then by the time that person has a meaningful relapse, they may have outlived their life expectancy anyway, so effectively it's a cure. Um, so uh, once again, if you get very deep, um, uh, very deep remissions and minimize the clone to very low levels, then perhaps you reduce the possibility of, of more aggressive clones coming through um, and uh, less likelihood of escaping treatment further on. Um, so I think by, I, I don't know the, the, how you would, the best way to time these drugs in combination, um, but uh, certainly I think in all cancer combinations of drugs seem to reduce uh, resistance and treatment to skip. So I think it certainly makes sense that these combinations should, mm. should be explored. Mm. Now, of course, until now we'd entered the era of chemoimmunotherapy. Um, do you believe that there's a role for antibodies in, in combination with these agents, or do you think they'd be used alone? Um, well, I think there's some suggestion that there's some syn synergy with the uh, BS3 biomedics and anti-CD20 antibodies. Um, the other, uh, idololysib seems to be always combined with um, uh, rituximab, um, and uh, so it will. it is likely that the anti-CD20 antibodies will continue, I believe, in, in treatment regimens. Um, I think the obvious question is which anti-CD20 antibody we use. I think it's looking at the data, it seems to be almost very difficult to get that extra 2-3%. Um, it seems logical that abenatuzumab is your best antibody. Stefan's data w with the green study, certainly the, the, the CRs and the blood and the bone marrow are certainly more impressive than you see with rituximab. Um, um, so it, I would imagine that that will probably be the antibody of choice going forward mm. in combination with these drugs. So we're on, we're on to the green study. Now it's very unlike a Genentech Roche study to have a, a thousand patient study that doesn't really kind of have a, a, a straightforward comparator. It's a very unusual design of a study from this company. What, what are your conclusions of what we learned from Green? Right, I think John, as you say, there has been you know debate if if green almost a thousand patient study, as you say, is a meaningful thing without um, having a randomized comparator. However, you know, I think you can look at it in another way. Actually, as you know, in green we enroll uh, frontline patients and relapsed refractory. We enroll fit and unfit, and then several risk mitigation uh, schemes with regard to infusion-related re reactions are applied. So in my opinion, actually, from all these uh, variations, you could say that actually green is a series of 10 smaller phase two studies combined into one concept. Okay. And since you know everything is standardized in that trial, uh, up to even MRD assessment centrally, I think uh, this makes perfect sense not to have a, a fragmented small set of some you know, smaller phase two studies, but combine it into big one big concept. And uh, as, as we discussed, I mean, trial design is challenging today with, with these results that we have. So we have, to, we have to tackle that with new concepts such as green, I think. Sure. Now on that issue, I mean, we've been hearing the whole meeting, uh, and you raised the issue, Patrick, about response rates being never less than 80%. Mm. Have we set a bar so high now that it's going to be more and more difficult to bring in other new improvements? And, and what, you know, if, if we look at saying we want to bring in doublets for frontline therapy, how do we, how do we beat the new standard um, 
uh, from you know, which pretty looking like a pretty flat line along the top from what you showed, uh, Alexandra. Well, it's it's uh, hard to understand with these drugs, which is the real meaning at the end of uh, complete remission. Uh, if you look at the data of uh, the resonance study, we had only 11% of complete remission, mm. and uh, the mm, the progression-free survival curve and the overall survival curve are quite perfect. I I say so. Uh, it's it's really mm, we need longer follow-up to understand what is going to happen in these patients. We had 11% complete remission and a very prolonged progression for survival. So I don't know if the monoclonal antibody there will add a lot in... in so you think it won't necessarily be the overall no. response rate, Maybe but the not. complete response rates and the MRD rates that are going to drive us going forward? Well, of course, at the moment, still, the, the regulatory authorities haven't quite accepted those as, 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 as valid endpoints for the study, but we're, of course, very hopeful that'll change going forward. Mm. Now, Stefan, you um, are also, of course, presenting data looking at, uh, you know, identification of factors which are risk factor for progression. Now, that raises the issue. I mean, Patrick already talked about the idea that maybe the front line for 17Ps, but do you think we might get to an era where you look at the risk stratification and you have different types of approaches for different patients based upon the risk is that might be something that goes happens going forward sure i think this is this is where the field evolves to isn't it i mean we have already in routine practice 17p deletion and tp53 mutation which clearly should guide therapy for every single patient in the frontline setting and in relapse now um, new um, adverse events are arising for instance there are patients who you despite the great results would not like to put on a brutinib uh, who had yes. a history of bleeding who have anticoagulation that is urgently required who had maybe a history of uh, severe arrhythmias so i mean probably in our trial design we will also refocus not only on molecular factors but also on clinical characteristics of the patient that make uh, the one patient more um, suitable for the one option or for the other option so i think we have to be a bit innovative here to uh, you know go away from the old all frontline uh, patients are yes. the same sure. now the other role that novel agents could have of course is in combination with chemotherapy we've been talking so far about novel novel combinations so we've seen uh, the data here of um, idolelacib in combination with bendamustine rituximab showing an improvement in outcome there now, of course, we'd already seen the Helios study of bendamustine plus ibrutinib being superior. My own view was that I could see very clearly what the ibrutinib or idolelacib is adding to the bendamustine, but I'm not quite sure that I'm yet seeing what the bendamustine is adding to the ibrutinib or the, or the idolelacib. Do you think going forward that apart from the younger, fitter patients for whom FCR remains the standards, that chemotherapy is over or do you think that we're going to be developing these drugs uh, in combination? Patrick, what do you what do you think? I am inclined to agree with you, uh, certainly with the Helios study. I didn't see what the bendamustine was adding at all. Um, with the uh, idolalis of bendamustine rituximab, it's certainly, um, it, it's certainly very impressive results. Um, the question always is with chemotherapy, um, that CLL is a disease of, of the old um, in general. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think, relating back to what you said earlier, when you have such very good overall response rates, I think people will start to look a little more at toxicities. Um, and uh, I wonder how much chemo adds to the toxicity and the efficacy. I mean, I think for going forward, I personally, my own view is that we're probably going to be moving away from chemotherapy. Um, there are, as a tangent to that, some people say that some chemotherapy may increase the efficacy of uh, antibody kill uh, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe that needs explored more. Um, but uh, I think overall, I, I think we should be at least considering chemo-free treatment for CLO. What, what do you think? Do you think the era of chemotherapy is over? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that data on FCR treatment are very strong in this moment and we have still to use FCR in fit patients in first line treatment. Uh, 
these now on that concept of course a lot of my patients all kind of object to the fact that all of these studies are you know, open to elderly less fit patients and they feel that they're not getting the opportunity <laughs> to have been a little bit abandoned by the field and a bit left behind used to have to try to make everyone see a score less than six to get them FCR and now you have to make it higher than six to give them a novel agent what do um, I mean I know that I know that there are ongoing trials of you know novel agents versus FCR but uh, Stefan you know wh how, what's the German CLL study groups view of the young fit patient and the novel agent versus hmm. Hmm. versus the FCR or BR standard sure I mean uh, it, it, it may look to you like uh, you know the young fit patients are the one that have uh, the least good treatment options mm. you know they are uh, obinutuzumab as possibly the best antibody in CLL is not yeah. licensed for them, sure. uh, and the, let alone ibrutinib, idilalisib, or venetoclax, at least in the frontline setting. So um, this may look a bit awkward. Um, on the other hand, we have to say, as Alessandra said, um, you know, we have uh, really FCR in some populations achieving with, with manageable toxicity really years and years, maybe even a decade of remission, treatment-free time. Uh, the patient is off, off, off drug. Uh, we know that with the new agents, well, it, they are only pills. Nevertheless, you know, a little bit of arthralgia maybe headache, maybe bruising. Uh, in, in the longer run, this can be, uh, you know, quite bothersome. So I think there is still risk benefit uh, benefits to weigh. And, and uh, I'm certainly well known as a friend of a chemotherapy free future. However, I mean, in the presence, I think uh, chemo free, chemotherapy free world is not already arrived, I think. Well, I mean, I agree if you've got a mutation IGBH and a 13Q deletion and you have FCR, you will have age match controls, people who don't have CLL. And, I mean, and that's certainly ex extremely difficult to argue with, but is that the majority of this, are those patients the majority of the CLL patients that you see in your clinic? Fit enough for FCR? Um, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, mutation IGBH and a 13Q mm. deletion. Mm. It's not the one or two word patients. answers for this question, but do you think, particularly if we start using ibrutinib frontline, that we may change the natural history, prevent the emergence of these um, re resistant clones that emerge? Do you think we could change the, the way in which we start to see 17P evolve and relapse? To say the truth, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this cell is a very intelligent cell, so uh, maybe. So we have to hit it from different directions. Yes, so again, yes, we come back to thinking yes. about uh, doublets. Yeah. But you've got to see what this meeting has confirmed is what we already knew is that these novel agents have completely revolutionized the way we think about and are able to treat uh, these, this disease. So there you have it from ASH in 2015 for CLL. Great news all round in terms of the continued studies we see uh, of the promise of the B-cell receptor uh, inhibitors, their efficacy in CLL, a new opening up from the Resonate 2 trial demonstrating for the first time the efficacy of this agent up front, hopefully leading to a licensing of this agent, a new era opening up for CLL patients.